Welcome to Battling and Beating Cancer. Uh, I'm Scott Seaman, along with Charlene, we welcome you to what really is a special edition, what's going to wind up being the show of shows for follicular lymphoma. Uh, this educational symposium is going to feature some of the great minds and hands of lymphoma, uh, research, education. Uh, we're dealing with people who are the top researchers, the top clinicians, and I think we know we brought you here on a Saturday, but you're going to get your money's worth. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, and how fabulous it is to be at Rush University Cancer Center and to be able to say those words and to be at Rush University Medical Center here at the Ciro Conference Center. Uh, because I know a lot of people over the years whose lives have been saved right here in this institution, and you're looking at uh, probably not the best looking example, but an example of one of them. And it's uh, tremendous to be able to see what's going on, and I'm gonna introduce somebody who's really an integral part of that in just a moment. Uh, so, got home last night and saw, well, we've got a bunch of economic woes, and we've got some instability in different parts of the world, and I, not much I know or can do about that, but I'm here to tell you that the State of the Union for people who have been diagnosed with follicular lymphoma has never been brighter, has never been better, their futures will never be longer or more, more hopeful than they are today. And that didn't happen by accident, it didn't happen overnight, it happened because of a lot of brilliant people, committed people doing a lot of good work, and we all are the beneficiaries of that, and we're gonna be the beneficiaries of a lot of new developments that are uh, uh, in designs as well as in practice today, and we're gonna be talking about that from some of the great experts. How are you guys feeling today? Well, you're looking damn good, I have to say. <laughs> How many people have been diagnosed with follicular lymphoma within the past year? All right, so for our radio crowd, uh, quite a few newbies. And how about people diagnosed more than a year ago? All right, so even more veterans. And that's great because you're all gonna be veterans and uh, be able to come to conferences like this for the next 75 to 100 years, which is one of the great things about the developments. And I should say, we're also uh, on CAN TV in Chicago, and we are streaming live uh, all over the World Wide Web. Uh, and it's sort of amazing. So people are tuning in to chicagobloodcancer.org, to roadtocure.com, and to Betsy's Hope for Lymphoma, uh, to Liz's Hope for Lymphoma Facebook page. And uh, the people that we have, uh, that we know about, every spot on the globe, all over the United States, Canada, uh, folks from Australia, from the Netherlands, from Ireland, from Africa, to the Middle East, to the Far East. So a lot of folks and a lot of patients coming together and uh, how well it is. How many of uh, folks are caregivers, loved ones of people? All right, let's give you guys a special round of applause. Because all of us folks with lymphoma, number one, we live for you, but to a large extent, we live because of you. Uh, what you do to keep us going is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, how many nurses out there today? I want to kiss all of you because every, every, every one of us knows there's nothing more important uh, than a good nurse because you guys give our care. And so there'll be some uh, continuing education as well, so make sure you get those forms before you leave. And for doctors, we're getting this certified and it's gonna go online and people will be able to get their continuing medical education credits from that. So this program, and you guys are gonna live in infamy on the internet, it's gonna broadcast about 10 times or more on CAN TV and all over the world through the various websites. So we really thank you for participating. And I have to tell you that uh, this is not just a random selection of the date. Today is World Lymphoma Awareness Day. And so we're all together and people across the globe, different organizations through the Lymphoma Coalition are doing different uh, projects, everything from making buildings red to educational events to survivor events. And it's, it's something that's, uh, uh, really good, but I'm gonna, it's not good enough, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, one of the 
the things that we wanted to do was uh, something that goes contrary to my instinct, because I'm a lawyer, so I always think everything's about me. We wanted to make this program about all of you. And so when you registered, we asked everybody, you know, what are the questions you have? What are the issues? Because the leading minds uh, are going to be addressing those, and I think you're going to see that. But we want your interaction, so please feel free to ask questions. Uh, all of these doctors, there's not a question you can stump them with. I challenge you to do it. Uh, the only thing that we ask is obviously, because these are great doctors, they're not going to diagnose you in the audience or make specific recommendations. They don't have your history. They haven't examined you, but they'll be able to give you a lot of information. And quite frankly, most of them, uh, including if you want to fly out to see Dr. Romo in Germany, I suspect he'd be willing to see you as well. So we really have a magical crew here uh, today. We're doing a couple things that, that I don't even know of. You know, a few years ago, if somebody said, I'm going to Google you, I think you could have them arrested. But now we know what that means. We're actually going to be Skyping. I'm not quite sure what that is, but uh, Liz knows. But we're going to be getting questions uh, brought to us, and we're going to bring them up uh, through the panel from everybody who's, who's participating on this globally. And as many people uh, who are here, there will be thousands of people uh, who are right now uh, watching and or listening to us on the Internet. So uh, we've got all of these, uh, these fun things going on. And we, in addition to the great doctors that we have, uh, I probably could put this better, but your main course for lunch is going to be Betsy DePerry. And Betsy's absolutely phenomenal. She's a survivor. And everybody here, when you turn in your evaluation forms, and you must, because Liz says you must turn those forms in, um, you'll get a copy of Liz's Adventures in Cancerland book and a copy of Charlene and my book, uh, Battling and Beating Cancer. So a uh, couple quick things, and you're doing them all. The numbers the doctors are going to talk about and tell you about how this disease fits in, uh, in terms of why we think what we do in the world of generating research is so important is because blood cancer research is virtually responsible for all of the major cancer treatments, everything from radiation to chemotherapy, first one in uh, lymphoma, leukemia, monoclonal antibodies, stem cell transplants. So it really transforms not just uh, helping people with blood cancer, but with all forms of cancer. And uh, you're doing all of the things you need to do to survive. You can take a look at that by being here, learning from the best doctors, getting the best treatment for your lymphoma. Because even though we were talking about follicular lymphoma, the fine lady in the fourth row, her follicular lymphoma is not the same as the gentleman in the second row. So we're learning a lot not only about the microbiology, but the treatments. And the doctors are going to be talking about that today. But that's really not enough. What we have to do as survivors and those who love survivors is lead the way to the cure. These doctors can't do it by themselves. We need to help. We need to help by raising awareness, by raising money for research, uh, because that's critical participation in clinical trials. So in our materials, you'll see a lot of information. But I hope all of you guys will get engaged in whatever activities and to whatever extent you feel comfortable about, because we really can make a difference. This is a superstar lineup of faculty members. Members. And I'm just going to say uh, one quick word about Stephanie Gregory, which is there is none better in terms of uh, being a hematologist, oncologist, but also the caring and love that she gives to her patients is phenomenal. So we're going to start out by uh, introducing somebody who's not even a lymphoma doctor. Uh, but he's Dr. Howard Kaufman. He's the director of the Rush University Cancer Center. He's a phenomenal doctor. He's a melanoma specialist. He's a specialist in immuno, immunology of cancers and tumors. And he's done such a phenomenal job here at Rush and really for all patients. And so, Dr. Howard Kaufman, come on up. Thank you for joining. So I'm delighted to be here today to welcome all of you to this important uh, session. And on behalf of the Rush University Cancer Center, I want to let you know that we are committed to really understanding lymphoma and finding cures for this disease. Um, I'd like to say a special welcome to our patients here. I, I don't think there can be a worse thing, a worse day in your life than finding out that you have cancer, whether it's lymphoma or any other kind. Uh, what does this mean? Uh, what do I do? Uh, 
Do I go to work? Do I not go to work? Do I go see a doctor? Which doctor do I see? What treatments do I have? Uh, there's a million questions. The most important thing I think that you can do is to get knowledge and get education. And I think your presence here today is a testament to the fact that you want to do that and this is the most important thing you can do. And I can tell you that you're going to be hearing from the world's experts in this disease and I think you're going to leave here armed with the most important thing you can do for battling this disease and that's to really understand it and know what's available. We've had tremendous progress in cancer. Uh, we now can cure probably 70%, maybe a bit more, of all cancers across the board. So this is not a time of, of um, uh, no hope. This is a time of extreme hope and enthusiasm in the field. And I think what's happened are a few things. We now talk about personalized medicine, and while yes, we want to take individual care of the patient uh, very well, we know that individual tumors are different. We know the genetics can be different from one patient to the next, and we're now able to study that faster and better than ever before. I was thinking back in the early 1990s, if you wanted to clone a single gene, it would take about three to five years to do that, not to mention a few million dollars to do that. Today, by next year, probably will take eight hours to do the same thing, and at a cost of probably about $100. Uh, so this has really revolutionized the field. So we can study uh, the, the cells, we can study the genes in an individual patient in a way that makes sense. A little more than what it takes to get a blood count now, we can actually get a genome profile, and that is really revolutionizing the field. We're quickly able to uh, genome sequence an entire tumor cell uh, for patients, and that's actually happened in, in, the, in lymphoma. The other thing that Scott mentioned, which I, of course, have to say something about, is the role of the immune system. The immune system is critically important, and the reason that it's so important is that when it works, the immune system can cure patients with cancer, and these can be long-term, durable responses that we get um, and can give patients really uh, long-term cures. And so understanding that is critically important. What's changed today is we know that it works. So we have a preventive vaccine for cervical cancer. We have a vaccine in prostate cancer. And last year for melanoma, we approved a drug called ipilimumab, which works through the immune system and is the first drug that's ever showed an overall survival benefit for patients with melanoma. And I have no doubt, and I think you're going to hear about it today, that the same thing can happen in lymphoma. So with that, it is now my real pleasure to be able to introduce um, the director today, Dr. Stephanie Gregory. And unfortunately, I cannot tell you all the things about her because it would take up the entire day. Um, I think many of you know her and know that in addition to being an outstanding clinician and really a leader in the therapeutic uh, intervention for, for lymphomas, she is a really, really great teacher. And I have to say that whether I, whether I see Dr. Gregory in the hallway briefly or whether we're sitting down at a meeting that has nothing to do with lymphoma, she's always teaching me about lymphoma. And so I have learned quite a bit from her. Uh, she is the uh, Elodia Chem uh, Chair of Hematology and Professor of Medicine in the Division of Hematology and Oncology at Rush University. And uh, she is a, a great colleague, uh, a, a great mentor, and a good friend. And I would like to turn this over to Dr. Gregory. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, the room is, is full, and we're pleased to see that. Um, I have been privileged to uh, work with tremendous people during my lifetime. Uh, colleagues, my physician friends, my lymphoma friends, uh, but mostly my patients and their caregivers because if it were not for you uh, who were willing to try novel approaches to therapy and to perhaps uh, engage yourself in a clinical trial, we would not be where we are today. Um, we have with us today um, the top lymphoma doctors in the country. And I don't want you to think that this is just one of the meetings that happens in lymphoma. I'm just looking back over the past summer, and it started with the American Society of Clinical Oncology meeting in Chicago in June. And then many of the physicians in this room went to the European Hematology Association in June. And then in July, they were at the Pan Pacific Lymphoma Conference. And then Dr. Rummel and I were fortunate enough to be in Newport, Rhode Island, where 190 physicians from all over the 
the world came to talk about one of the rarer lymphomas that accounts for only 2% of lymphomas, Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. And it was at that meeting that we actually found out that a, a brand new mutation has been discovered uh, called the MYD88 mutation in Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. The next week, it was a lead article in the New England Journal of Medicine by Dr. Steve Trion at the Dana-Farber. We also learned that that activates, that mutation activates a pathway known as the NF-kappa-B pathway. And we now know that a new, new pathway inhibitor that you're going to hear about, uh, that our guest speakers have worked on, an or a pill inhibits that pathway. And it's a very effective agent now with very few side effects. So these are the kinds of advances. Uh, Dr. Henry Fung was just at a meeting on T-cell lymphomas with a whole group of nationally known transplanters. There's a meeting this weekend going on in Bologna, in Italy, on T-cell lymphomas. So there is never a day when there is not a group of experts getting together and learning more from each other about where we are with lymphoma. I think I would like to turn over to our speakers now and start. Um, with Dr. Brad Call. Brad, I've known for many years. He has just blossomed so very quickly from finishing his fellowship at the University of Wisconsin to becoming the lead uh, member of the lymphoma group at the Eastern, Onco uh, Eastern Cooperative Oncology Group. He's collaborating with the other uh, groups in the United States, and many, many new protocols have come out in uh, lymphoma. Now, I know that there are many of my patients here today who do not have follicular lymphoma. You saw the program, you have lymphoma. I don't want you to think that you cannot ask questions about your lymphoma. If you have a low-grade lymphoma, what we're saying today about follicular lymphoma applies to all of you. If you have a more aggressive lymphoma or a Hodgkin lymphoma, many of the drugs that we're going to talk about today will have the ability to work in those diseases. So please, please, this is your meeting. We want you to ask questions. Um, Brad, please come on up. Dr. Cole is um, an expert known for the resort trial. I hope he tells you a little bit about this. Uh, the question of how we treat follicular lymphoma patients. You must understand that you either have low tumor burden, high tumor burden. Most of you have advanced stage disease. Many of you will not need treatment. Dr. Cole's study actually was looking at early treatment in patients with follicular lymphoma who had a low tumor burden, and then actually putting them on a maintenance for two years versus waiting to retreat them when they actually relapsed. And you're going to hear about some of this. Many of you have questions about, should I be on rituxan maintenance? Should I not be treated? And I hope Dr. Cole's going to answer some of those questions. So it's my pleasure now to turn the first topic over to Dr. Cole. Brad, welcome. Thank you, um, Stephanie. Um, a great pleasure to be here. I always enjoy um, coming down to Chicago for Madison, especially after a Packer victory. <laughs> Actually, um, I was in clinic on Monday, which was the day after the Packers had uh, were manhandled by the 49ers and the Bears had really looked impressive. And I, I have a few patients who come from Northern Illinois to see me, and two of the patients are huge bear fans, and boy, did they give it to me in clinic that day. So I was feeling a lot better on Friday. Um, so, uh, so let me update you on low tumor burden follicular lymphoma. But before I do that, I'm going to spend a few minutes just talking about um, follicular lymphoma in general terms. Uh, follicular lymphoma is in the category of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma that we consider indolent. So indolent refers to the natural history of the lymphoma. These tend to be slow-moving cancers. Um, they generally are not curable with the drugs we have in 2012, but they're very readily treatable, and the prognosis is relatively good for, for all of these groups of lymphomas. So this is a listing of the lymphomas that we consider to be indolent. This would include follicular, small lymphocytic lymphoma, something called marginal zone lymphoma, there's a nodal version, there's a splenic version, and there's something called malt lymphoma. All the things I'm going to say today, which are focusing on follicular, you could really apply to these other lymphomas. 
So here's a pie graph showing um, frequency distribution of, of the different kinds of lymphomas. So there are lots of different kinds of lymphomas, and they're all, they all have their uniqueness. Follicular lymphoma makes up about 25% of new lymphomas in North America. So follicular is the second most common kind of non-Hodgkin's. Uh, it's typically advanced stage at presentation, and I'll get into the staging in a second. The reason is that patients are often asymptomatic for a long time. So you could walk around for years, quite honestly, with this lymphoma, not knowing you have it, because it doesn't give symptoms. There's no reason to go to the doctor if you feel perfect. Um, and so often by the time it's diagnosed, it's very widespread in the body. That's typical for follicular lymphoma. It's hard to know what to tell people who are diagnosed now, what the average survival is. Uh, that's why I said 12 plus years. We don't really know. We know that it's a moving target. And um, there's, there's data now indicating that patients diagnosed in the last few years clearly live longer than patients who were diagnosed 15 and 20 years ago. So we know we're making progress and that the outcomes are improving each year. I mentioned about the, you know, the unhappy property of generally not being curable. It's hard to know if, if people are cured or not with this disease because the natural history is so long. And I avoid using the cure word with patients, and that's not to be negative, but you know, I've seen patients who've had to come back after 10 and 15 and 20 years, so it's hard to know if anyone is ever cured with this thing, so I, I, I like to use other words when we're describing how we manage this kind of lymphoma. Follicular lymphoma can transform to a more aggressive version of lymphoma, that's called transformation, and that happens at a rate of about 3% per year, although the risk tends to diminish over time. But when transformation occurs, we then have to treat the lymphoma as an aggressive lymphoma. To diagnose follicular lymphoma, um, there are some things we can do. We can look at what proteins are expressed on the surface of the cell. So this is this term called immunophenotype. This stuff, CD10, CD19, CD22, that just tells us some of the different proteins that are sticking outside the tumor cells and we can measure these things. Cytogenetics refers to how the DNA is rearranged inside the tumor cells. And most cases of follicular lymphoma have a specific DNA alteration. We call it a translocation. So a piece of DNA gets moved from chromosome 14 to 18 and vice versa. They flip-flop. And the result is you get overexpression of a certain gene. The gene is called BCL2, which results in overexpression of a certain protein called BCL2. And that sends a signal to those cancer cells that says, don't die. So the cells, they're not proliferating all that rapidly, but they accumulate. Um, so this BCL2 overexpression is very central and key to the underlying biology of follicular lymphoma. Grading is a term that sometimes confuses people. That's different than staging. Grading is what we see when we look at the tumor cells in, um, under the microscope. So, most of follicular lymphoma cells are what we consider small, but occasionally you see big cells intermixed amongst the small cells. And the, the more big cells there are, the higher the grade. So here are the criteria. We, if it's 1 to 5, it's grade 1. If it's 6 to 15 large cells, it's grade 2. And we lump those two together now in pathology reports. So it'll say grade 1-2. We just lump those two groups together. Most follicular lymphoma patients have grade 1-2. Maybe 15%, 20% have grade 3, which means there's more than 15 large cells in each field that you're looking at under the microscope. And then the grade 3 is further subdivided into 3A and 3B. 3B means it's just sheets of large cells. It's all you see are large cells. And if we see a grade 3B patient, we generally treat them like an aggressive lymphoma. The three A's are a little controversial. Should they be treated like the aggressive lymphomas or can they be treated more like the grade one, grade twos? I don't think anybody really knows the answer to that and different physicians will approach that entity in different ways. So staging refers to where the cancer is located in the body. Um, 
Stage one is the cancer is just in one lymph node group. Stage two is it's in two or more, but on one side of the diaphragm or the other. Stage three means that uh, the cancer is above and below the diaphragm. And stage four means the disease is in lymph nodes and also outside of lymph nodes, like lymph nodes plus bone marrow. Staging was developed for Hodgkin lymphoma and then applied to non-Hodgkins. And I'll be honest, the staging in follicular, it's not the most important thing. People get really focused on their stage and don't do that. Most people are stage three and stage four and have an excellent prognosis. So the stage of follicular lymphoma is not the most important thing. When we diagnose a patient with follicular lymphoma, usually they present with a lump, a swollen enlarged lymph node. And to make an accurate diagnosis, you need an adequate biopsy. And an adequate biopsy means you need a, a, a chunk. You need a lot to look at under the microscope. And probably Stephanie will attest to this, one of the most common situations we see are people have had teeny tiny biopsies and the pathology report is really squirrely and you're just not sure what you're dealing with and we often send people back for more tissue because we want to know exactly what you have before we make important decisions about how best to manage your disease. So you need adequate tissue and then we can do all sorts of fancy things with the biopsy immunophenotyping where you look at what kind of proteins are on the surface. We can look at the genetic alterations inside the cells and, and with adequate tissue and with immunophenotyping and cytogenetics, we can figure out what people have. Once we figure out what they have, we do this thing called the staging evaluation, which is a physical examination and a history. Do you have symptoms? If, if yes, what are they? We do some blood work to look at how the critical organs are working, the liver, the kidneys, how your bone marrow is functioning. We typically do a bone marrow biopsy to see if the bone marrow is involved with follicular lymphoma. And we do imaging. And the imaging could either be uh, CT scans, or it could be PET scans, or it could be both. Um, CT scans give you very good anatomy. Uh, PET scans um, tell you something a little different. When you get a PET scan, they inject some, some radioactive sugar into the vein, and the sugar is preferentially taken up inside cancer cells. And when you look at a PET scan, you see bright spots. Um, and now with technology, we can integrate the CT scans and the PET scans and get these very fancy images that show the anatomy plus the spots as being bright or not bright. So very powerful technology to see where the cancer is. And then it's even more useful after treatment to make sure it's gone. Once we've done all that, you, uh, we can assign a flippy score to a follicular lymphoma patient, which looks at can we go back, thanks? Which looks at um, five risk factors. And the more these risk factors a patient has, the worse the follicular lymphoma is in terms of prognosis, the fewer the better. So being over 60, having stage three, four disease, anemic, which is a hemoglobin less than 12, a high LDH, that stands for lactate dehydrogenase, or more than four involved nodal sites. And zero to one of these things means you're low risk, two means intermediate risk, three or more means, quote, high risk. And then you, you can see the distribution, the different five-year and 10-year overall survival. These are estimates for a population. And don't um, burn these numbers into your brain because this data was generated on patients who were treated 10 and 15 and 20 years ago. So to be honest, these numbers don't even apply anymore. But it, we can still give a patient an idea of what category they're in if they want to know. Um, to be honest, where this is most helpful is when the doctors are trying to evaluate studies in literature because it tells us what kind of patients went on to the study. Because you could, you could pick um, a treatment and you could uh, put a bunch of patients with low or intermediate risk Philippi on and you'd get one set of data and then you could pick a, the exact same treatment and the study could have a bunch of high risk Philippi patients and the data won't look so good. And if you don't know what the Philippi risk distribution is, you would think that it was because of the treatment. 
but it wasn't. So that's where doctors can get faked out if they don't know what kind of patients go on a clinical trial. So that's where this is most useful. Okay, so I already said this, the disease is generally incurable, but the prognosis is generally good and improving. And there are so many good treatments for follicular lymphoma, it actually makes the decision making very difficult. And that's a good problem to have. So when I see um, a new patient in clinic with follicular lymphoma, my simplistic brain breaks it down into two, a two by two table. The first thing I wanna know is, uh, do, does this patient have symptoms, yes or no? Because if they have symptoms, we should treat them because we have good treatments that work and the treatments will make them feel better. It'll make their symptoms go away. So when they have symptoms, the decision making is relatively easy. We need to start on some kind of treatment. We just have to settle on what kind of treatment. If the patient has no symptoms, then the, the next thing to figure out is what is the tumor burden? And I think the tumor burden is more important than the stage, quite honestly. So the way I explain this to patients, this tumor burden concept, if we took all the cancer cells out of your body and made a pile, how big would the pile be? And high tumor burden has different implications than low tumor burden. Now we have some criteria for tumor burden these are called the GELF criteria, and these are reasonably useful criteria. Three nodes bigger than three centimeters, a single node bigger than seven centimeters, symptoms, risk of organ compression from the lymphadenopathy, a leukemic phase, which means the cells, the follicular lymphoma cells are circulating in the blood. If we see the blood counts dropping due to bone marrow involvement by the follicular lymphoma or a spleen above a certain size, if a patient has any one of these things, they would fall into the high tumor burden category. <clears throat> so my job today is to focus on the low tumor burden population, which is the upper left box. And there are a lot of newly diagnosed patients who fall into this box. So I'm gonna focus on that group of patients now when we talk about management strategies. And what I said in the box here is, in my mind, the, the general approach is we either do watch and wait, and I'll explain why, or I think some patients are candidates for treatment with rituximab as a single agent. I personally generally do not administer chemotherapy to this group of patients at diagnosis. Well, why? Well, th there have been three randomized clinical trials uh, generated in the literature over the years which took this group of patients, this low tumor burden asymptomatic group of patients, and they enrolled them in a study. And half the patients uh, started out on immediate chemotherapy. And the other half the patients started out on the strategy of just close observation, or so-called watch and wait. And then their treatment would be initiated when it had to be. In other words, they, the patient then developed high tumor burden at some point, or they developed symptoms at some point. That's when their treatment would be initiated. This is very counterintuitive for a newly diagnosed cancer patient. You're, you're gonna watch me? Are you out of your mind? Um, so half the patients are starting on immediate treatment, half are not. With all three studies, if you look at the proportion of patients alive at five years, at 10 years, at 15 years, it's identical. There was no survival advantage for the patients who started on immediate treatment. It didn't hurt them either in terms of the survival. The survival was the same. But the patients starting on immediate treatment, which was chemo, presumably have some detriment in their quality of life for starting on chemotherapy. So based on that, the paradigm of starting folks initially on watch and wait was born. And that is the standard. That is what is typically done in the world for this group of patients. Now, having said that, all of these trials were done in the pre-rituximab era, the 1980s and the 1990s. Rituximab came around in the late 1990s. Um, and rituximab has been a big difference maker uh, for follicular lymphoma. But 
there has never been a trial of rituximab plus chemotherapy versus watch and wait. Such a trial has never been done, so we don't know what the outcome would be in that kind of a setting. We have no data to guide us. And I, to my knowledge, there is no trial planned. Matthias, do you know of any trial planned for that? Very hard study to do, and you can imagine why. If you're a newly diagnosed patient and you're going to be randomly assigned by a coin flip, watch and wait, chemo. You know, folks don't like that, which is understandable. It's a hard thing to do. Uh, it's a hard study to conduct. It's a hard study to execute, and it takes years to collect the data. It's a hard study to do, so we don't have that data. There is now one trial of rituximab as a single agent, no chemotherapy, just rituximab versus watch and wait, that has been presented at a national meeting. It's still not published, but I'm going to show you a little bit of data from that study to, to show you what immediate treatment with rituximab can do. This was the study. It was done by a group in um, the United Kingdom with some help from some other countries, Australia, Turkey. Um, it was a randomized clinical trial, which means patients were assigned to one treatment or another. And it had three arms or three different pathways that a patient could go on. So the top arm, I do have a pointer. OK, so the top arm patients a third of the patients were assigned to watch and wait. A third of the patients were assigned to rituximab for four weekly doses, which is the typical way we give that drug. And then no further treatment, just observation. And then a third of the patients were assigned to rituximab for four weekly doses plus so-called maintenance rituximab, where you receive a single dose every two months out to two years. So this is. We call this induction, and then this is the maintenance part when you get the rituximab on an ongoing basis. After a while, they stopped the enrollment, whoops, they stopped the enrollment to that middle arm, the arm B. Next slide, please. Okay, so now you probably know that we cancer doctors are crazed about Kaplan-Meier curves, and I apologize, but this is a Kaplan-Meier curve. And this tells us how the population does over time. So let me, let me explain this, this graph to you. The black bar is the patients who started on watch and wait. The red bar are the patients who receive rituximab for four weekly doses, no maintenance. The green bar are patients who received rituximab plus maintenance. And everybody starts out um, with their cancer not growing at time zero. And progression means the cancer is now growing. And every time a patient's cancer grows, the curve drops down. So what you can see here is the patients who received rituximab, here's two years out. About half the patients had had their cancer progress by two years in the watch and wait arm. And far fewer numbers had had their patients progress if they received rituximab. So we call this progression-free survival, survival without progression. So rituximab improved the progression-free survival. But to be honest, that is no surprise. You're giving patients some treatment versus no treatment. So we knew this was going to happen. We just, we just don't know what the magnitude of the difference is. So it's useful information to tell us what the difference is, but we knew this was going to separate these curves. The next thing they looked at, time to initiation of new therapy. And this is the time it takes to move on to your next line of treatment, whatever that treatment is, chemo, radiation. So here's the watch and wait group. Here's the groups that received rituximab times four induction. Here's the maintenance arm. So again, it took longer to move on to another line of treatment if you started out on rituximab. At three years, over half the patients in watch and wait had moved on to some kind of treatment, and most of the patients on rituximab had not. So there's clearly a benefit in delaying your time to your next treatment. Again, not a huge surprise. These people are, have already had one line of treatment. These people have had zero lines of treatment. 
So that's kind of a predictable result also. Okay, here's the overall survival. This is the probability of being alive at two years, at three years, at four years. There is no difference, as you can see. So once again, to date, there is no detrimental effect for watch and wait in this population in terms of your likelihood of being alive at two years, three years, four years. You with me so far? Okay. So what do you do with this information? <laughs> <laughs> this is a struggle because you can see there are some benefits by some endpoints. And by other endpoints, there are not benefits, like overall survival. So if you want to improve the progression-free survival and the time to next treatment, rituximab does that. If you want to improve the overall survival, it does not. It gets down to the question of what endpoints really matter. And I'm kind of the opinion that only an individual patient can tell me that, because I think the answer will be different from person to person. <sighs> there is this issue of quality of life then. And because these patients are asymptomatic, it's not an, it's not an issue of symptoms or how you feel. It's a psychological quality of life issue. And how much benefit is there psychologically from being in remission, which rituximab can do, versus not being in remission if you're in the watch and wait arm. And these investigators tried to sort that out. So they did this thing called quality of life assessments in the vast majority of the patients. And they looked before and after randomization, uh, one month, every two months, for two years, every six months, patients would fill out these questionnaires. These are the tools that they used. I don't want to spend much time on this. The point is, it all focused on um, depression, anxiety, and coping. Those are the issues that we're trying to capture with these scales. I think uh, that's just repeats what I said already. What you really want to see is, can you go back one slide? What you're really trying to see is, does the immediate treatment with rituximab result in increased functional well-being? That would be a global term that encompasses the anxiety, depression, and the coping. Functional well-being. OK, next slide. OK, so it turned out that there were um, a minority of patients that suffered from anxiety and depression. 13% anxiety, 3% depression. Um, so that's a significant minority, although most did not. Patients assigned to rituximab had less anxiety and depression than those on watch and wait. So there was some benefit for rituximab. But most patients functioned very well and most patients, whether you got rituximab or watch and wait, adapted to their illness over time. And I guarantee you, Stephanie will tell you that she sees this in her practice all the time, that people are super uncomfortable with watch and wait, but over time, they adapt to it. Not everybody. Some people don't. But many do. I've had some people who were practically ready to fire me when I said watch and wait. And then four years later, when I said, it's time to treat, I had to drag them into the treatment room kicking and screaming. So I mean, folks can really change mentally uh, their adaptation over time. So here are my conclusions. Given the lack of overall, overall survival difference, it remains perfectly acceptable to do watch and wait. And that's generally where I start the conversation with the patient. There are some benefits to rituximab as a single agent in terms of progression-free survival and time to next treatment. And I discuss these with the patients. We go over all this. And for a minority of patients, they do have significant anxiety and coping issues with watch and wait. And it, it actually really detracts from their quality of life significantly. And I think for this, this group, rituximab has real benefit. And so I try hard to ascertain who these folks are. 
And for those patients, some patients, maybe 15, 20% of my population, I will start them on rituximab for this issue. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, Stephanie mentioned this trial uh, resort, ECOG 4402. This was this trial we did in the Eastern Cooperative Oncology Group. And it was in this exact same patient population, this low tumor burden, asymptomatic patient population. Kind of a confusing study to understand, so I'm gonna try to spend just a minute on that. But everybody started out on rituximab, and if they responded, which turned out to be 70%, seven out of 10 patients would go into remission after four weekly doses of rituximab, they would then be randomized. And half the patients received rituximab as a maintenance strategy with no stop date. As long as the drug is working and as long as you keep, want to keep taking it, you can stay on it. So there have been people on maintenance on this study now for five, six, and seven years versus retreatment, which would mean you get your four weekly doses and then we go into observation mode. And we just watch that group of patients very closely. And once we see progression on a CAT scan or by physical exam, lymph nodes starting to grow again, we will retreat you with four weekly doses, try to put you back in remission, and then we will take our hands off you again. And then just start watching you and do it all over again. And you could keep doing retreatment as long as it's working. So it's it's um, an issue of getting ongoing predetermined rituximab versus as needed rituximab. And the, the main endpoint was time to treatment failure. Basically, when does the rituximab stop working for you? So I'm just gonna give you the bottom line. This, we presented this at a meeting last year. This was a study that took a long time to do. Um, there was no difference between the two treatment strategies and the time to treatment failure. Same result. It was a tie. If you look at time to first chemotherapy, the maintenance was a little better. At three years, 95% of the maintenance patients were chemo free, had not moved on to chemo versus 86% of the retreatment patients. So small benefit there. Although it came at a cost it took three and a half times, there was three and a half times more rituximab used in the maintenance population to get this result, to get the tie for this and the slight benefit for this. Both arms were well tolerated actually, but there was a little more toxicity on maintenance. So I promise you, we stared at this data for a long time trying to figure out how to we wanted to interpret it and what message we wanted to give. But we finally concluded that we thought that retreatment was our recommended strategy if using rituximab in this patient population. That's because there was the, a tie for the primary outcome, a small benefit for this, this outcome at the cost of a lot more drug. I should mention no difference in overall survival. Okay, the overall survival is equivalent. A lot more drug used, a little more toxicity. I'm not saying maintenance is bad or wrong. This was like a close call. But between the two strategies, if I see a patient with low tumor burden follicular lymphoma and we don't do watch and wait and we do start on rituximab, I recommend the retreatment strategy to them based on this. Okay, so here are my conclusions. Uh, low tumor burden follicular lymphoma, this means the disease is asymptomatic and there's a low disease burden. Watch and wait is a very commonly used strategy. If your doctor recommends this, they're not crazy. This is based on old data and we admit that. And we don't know what rituximab and chemo together will do for this patient population. It's unclear. Rituximab is a single agent has been shown now to delay the time to chemotherapy, but has not shown an impact on overall survival. It does improve the quality of life for a minority of patients. Using a maintenance strategy versus a retreatment strategy results in very comparable outcomes. And so both are reasonable. I prefer retreatment for this patient population. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Please, uh, and if you can come to the microphone, that would be wonderful.
Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, please. Rituxan, Rituxan treatment and Rituximab is the same? Yes, Rituxan and Rituximab is the same drug. I, you know, I made an assumption that most people knew what this drug is. I hope that was correct. If you don't, Rituximab is a monoclonal antibody, which means it's a protein. It's not a chemical like chemotherapy. Um, it's infused into the veins intravenously. It circulates through the blood. It will stick to the outside of the lymphoma cells. It will coat the lymphoma cells. And when it does that, it tries to trick your immune system into coming and killing the cancer. And that's how the drug works. Um, there's no nausea, there's no vomiting, there's no hair loss. It doesn't have a lot of the bad things we think of with chemotherapy. So from a side effect and toxicity profile, it's an attractive drug. Uh, yes, hi, I'm Melanie. My question is, the Affordable Care Act, how does that impact the overall survival rates and will that impact whether you get drugs or not based on whether they're effective or not in the long term? Um, I don't see the Affordable Care Act uh, impacting the way we are able to practice medicine at all. I don't see it affecting us in a negative effect in a negative way at all. I have no, no worries, no concerns about that personally. Um, one of the things that um, the federal government is very interested in is this thing called comparative effective research. You might have heard that term. Actually, the resort trial is a decent example of that. There was an assumption that maintenance was better and lots of drug is being prescribed with unclear benefit and I think we just showed that you can give a lot less drug and save a lot of money societally with comparable outcomes. So I think the resort trial is a pretty good example of comparative effective re research. Yes. Uh, My name's Larry and I yes. have two questions actually. Uh, the first one was on the GELF criteria for the high tumor burden. Yeah. And you said any one of the criteria would qualify somebody as high tumor burden. And one of those criteria was the system, uh, systemic symptoms or any symptoms. Could you kind of give more details on what that would involve? So the most common symptoms for a lymphoma patient would be um, fevers, night sweats, weight loss. Those are so-called B symptoms. Um, sometimes people will experience pain from enlarging lymphadenopathy. Um, Another symptom sometimes people will sometimes report is fatigue, and that is a tricky one, trying to decide if the fatigue people feel or experience is from their lymphoma or not. You really have to drill down with patients on that one. I've had patients in clinic and they're like, oh, I'm so tired, this has got to be this follicular lymphoma, and I'm like, oh, okay, so give me an example. I'm like, you know, are you able to do your, your, your job? Oh, yeah, yeah, I work two jobs. I work 16 hours a day. Um, I only get about five hours of sleep a night. I got three kids in school, soccer, football, da 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 And I just have no energy after all that. Um, so, you know, you, you have to sort that out before you ascribe the fatigue to the lymphoma. Very good. Thank you. Yep. And the second question had to do with the uh, no trials of our chemotherapy in the population for the low tumor burden and, and asymptomatic. Is there any anecdotal evidence since patients even in that category can, based on patient preference, be treated? So has there been experience where doctors have kind of observed anything? It's a great question. Um, the question is about our chemo and that patient population. You know, I typically don't do it. And the problem with the anecdotes is these patients do very well, right. no matter what you do. And so if you do an R chemo trial or if you do a couple anecdotes in your practice, those patients are going to do fabulous, but they would have done fabulous with other strategies. So the real question is, is, is it better than what you otherwise could have done? Um, so I don't have any useful <laughs> answer for that question. Maybe some of the other speakers will. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, my question is, you were talking about how you would treat a, a newly diagnosed person presenting themselves with asymptomatic and low tumor burden. Right. What about somebody who's had, has 
the, the same characteristics, but has had lymphoma for 15 years. Right. Someone who's been, th who's had some treatment or has never had treatment? Uh, who has had maybe minimal treatment, mm -hmm. like, in other words, they've had rituxan, right. and maybe they've had ri radiation also, Sure. but uh, it, it, would they be a good candidate for, it, it, would the rituxan maintenance be different for them, or the retreatment option, which would be better for them? <laughs> yeah. um, is there a difference? Well... We don't know for sure. Um, in general, the same rules apply. So there's a huge population of follicular lymphoma patients who have had some prior treatment, mm -hmm. whose disease has now come back, mm -hmm. but they are asymptomatic with low tumor burden. All the same rules apply. Everything I just said, I believe, applies to that patient population. You can do watch and wait. You can do treatment. All of these treatments have a high likelihood of working. You could do rituximab, you could do it as a single agent, you could do it as maintenance. It's the exact same thought process to everything I just described. You have all those options. Um, and we don't think that jumping in with an early intervention for that second, to, to induce the second or third remission changes the overall survival. Mm -hmm. so, so we will, Typically, we will watch and wait those patients until the disease advances to a point where treatment is, is indicated. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Last question, thank you. Okay. This is not really a question. I'd just like to share with you my experience of being asymptomatic. As I was diagnosed in August of last year with um, non-Hodgkin's uh, follicular lymphoma. Mm -hmm. um, five months prior to that, I had blood work done for an outpatient surgery unrelated to my lymphoma. My blood work was normal. My blood tests were normal. Showed no, no high, no high, nothing abnormal at all. And that's all. typical. Yeah. Yep. So, so I didn't have any symptoms until right. two months later when I had a lump in the side of my neck about the size of a marble, yeah. which I, I just kind of like let it go until a few weeks later I had two on my collarbone mm -hmm. and then and I knew I had still to. still watch and wait? No, I, I underwent treatment. I had, I just, I'm. I had chemotherapy last fall. Yeah. So one of the things that you will often see, it's, it's always OK to start out on watch and wait. And you learn a lot by watching that individual patient over the next several months. Every patient is different. I cannot emphasize that strongly enough. And you have patients, you'll have no budging in anything for years and years and years. And then the next person you see, you started out on watch and wait, and they come back three months later, and everything's growing and you got to change the plan. So it's always okay to start out watching and you just adapt and you change the plan based on what you're seeing before you. That is totally appropriate. Okay, thanks. Excellent presentation, thank you, Brad. So we'd learned about low tumor burden, and I think it is so important that this is why you're here, to get knowledge. And the more knowledge you have about your disease, the better you may be treated during the course of your disease, because you can question your doctor as to why are you recommending that. So please learn about low tumor burden. Understand what high tumor burden is and what symptoms are. Um, and there will be a time when you may develop symptoms and a higher tumor burden and require more than just rituximab monotherapy. And also many patients who have had perhaps maintenance rituximab therapy may become refractory to that. So you have to learn what that means. Refractory to a drug means that you either had no response to it at all, your lymph nodes are growing through that treatment, or that you had progressive disease within six months after receiving that drug. And so there's a whole group of patients down the road who will become rituximab refractory. And there are definite, definite approaches to those patients, and there are actually uh, drugs and uh, other forms of therapy that have been approved for the patient who is rituximab refractory. Uh, Dr. Rommel is our next speaker. He comes to us from Germany. He's head of hematology. He is uh, world famous and a friend, and has done 
probably most of the work uh, with Ben Demustine in Germany and brought that drug to the United States. Dr. Brad Call uh, treated 100 patients and led to the approval of Ben Demustine in the United States for relapsed and refractory low-grade lymphoma. And so Dr. Rummel's going to talk about what to use when rituximab isn't working. And then he's also going to tell us about a very exciting trial that he performed in Germany comparing some regimens using bendamustine and some older therapies. So Dr. Romo, it's a pleasure to have you. So thank you very much. It's a great honor and a pleasure for me to be here. When I was invited by the organizers, I immediately um, said, yes, I will come due to three reasons. First, it is about follicular lymphoma, and I'm treating patients with lymphoma in Germany since 20 years, and this is my focus. Second, um, it is Stephanie Gregory, a very well-acknowledged colleague. I know her for a very long time, and she wrote the invitation, and that was the second reason. And the third reason, of course, is that they are um, interested in also showing my results, and I really want to um, stand for my results in order to communicate it to doctors, to physicians, to nurses, in order to share knowledge, as it was already mentioned before. Before I start, I also want to say some comments on the talk of Brett Karl. I absolutely agree with everything. We have the same strategy in Germany, exactly the same discussion and the thoughts. And I just want to add something with these anecdotes, for example, in that particular situation that you are really on a low tumor burden and you get chemotherapy plus rituximab and you're doing so well. And Brett Karl has said and discussed, yes, but also a patient without it is doing well. And one of the most important results of that one trial, which was mentioned from Brett Karl with that observation against immediate chemotherapy, is when you look to the curve for the patients without chemotherapy at all, they go to treatment, as Brett Karl described, after two years. But some patients, and this is approximately 18%, are still without any chemotherapy after 15 years. So these patients would be absolutely overtreated. So if you have an anecdote with a patient, he is out of treatment and no treatment for 15 years, you cannot base your whole strategy on one case. And the same for a patient who is doing very well after chemo rituximab in that situation. So we need randomized trials with a large cohort of patients before we can understand something and before we can give a recommendation to the general population. So my talk today is treatment and management of high tumor burden, bulky or symptomatic follicular lymphoma. And the second issue is what if chemotherapy or rituximab is not working? And so that is, of course, now a different challenge because the question in that moment is already answered. The patient needs chemotherapy, so we were all through that considerations if chemo or not, if watch and wait or rituximab or chemo plus rituximab. So when it comes to that decision, the next question arrive, arise, which is the best treatment? And as Brett mentioned, probably in some patients, um, a uh, different treatment is the best according to their life situation, circumstances, widespread of the disease, symptoms, comorbidities. But in general, we have to learn out of what we found in our clinical studies. So um, because I'm talking about here um, studies um, which have done in parts in Germany, I have to say that, that some of the therapies I'm going to introduce to you still are investigational because they are not approved in the States for that particular indication. In particular, I'm talking about bendamustin, which is not approved for first line. But due to the two studies in America, led by Jonathan Friedberg and in particular by Brett Karl, that bendamustin is available in the States as a treatment for patients who are refractory to rituximab treatment. 
So that is my first talk. What is if chemo or rituximab is not working? We have two different terms which can be used in that direction. The one doctor is saying it's refractory, the patient, and the other one can say, no, you did not respond. So it's very critical to find the difference. Re refractory, of course, means that you are refractory to probably all chemotherapy agents and I, there is not uh, too much patience in that situation. So usually it's the case you do not respond to the one chemo, maybe you do not respond to the second chemo, but maybe the third selection is giving you a response. But the other question is what if rituximab does not give you a response? And then we say if this happened within six months after the last rituximab treatment, then we call it, a called, according to a general um, consensus, a rituximab refractory patients. So in that particular situation, there is, was an official registration trial and this was done, as mentioned before, by Brad Carl in the state. It was a multi-center study around the country. And this was the compound Trianda, that is a trade name. And the chemical name for this is Bendamastin. And this was investigated as a single agent in patients who progressed during or within six months of any rituximab chemotherapy. So, what is Trianda? Trianda is the trade name of the Bendamastin, and I want to show you just some information what Bendamastin is. Is it something new? No, it is of course new in most parts of the world. On the other side, it is 50 years old because it was developed behind the so-called Iron Curtain, which is a former East Bloc German country, East Germany. So in that part of the country, they developed the bendamustin, and the reason for that was, of course, that they don't want to negotiate in these days at all with West Germany. We had our Cold War, unfortunately. We did not communicate to each other. It was strictly against the law, at least from east to west. So they produced their own chemotherapy, and they wanted to be better than West Germany. That was the rule of the Cold War. That is your enemy. You have to be better. So they had the goal to develop a chemotherapy which in the end should be better working than cyclophosphamide and less toxic than cyclophosphamide. Of course, a very good wish. Everybody wants to have something like this which is better in the end as next toxic. And of course it was a wish of the people in Jena in East Germany in the years 1960s when they developed it. So they found this bendamustin. So one side of the coin is that they gave it to all patients with that diseases. All non-Hodgkin lymphoma, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, multiple myeloma, Hodgkin's disease, also some patients with breast and lung cancer were treated with a treatment. On the other side, they have not published it at all because they were not communicating with the international community. They did not use the English language. The only language they learned was Russian. So they just wrote some small publications publications in German language only available in East Germany. That is the reason why the rest of the world had no idea that something like Bendermastin is existing. After the reunification of Germany, it happens that the East German colleagues told us you can use Bendermastin in that disease. And of course, to be very honest, in the very first years we all were very skeptical because what comes out of East Germany <laughs> was not at all accepted from the West German people. This is what we thought, and of course it was not politically correct to say so. So we didn't say it, we said yes, okay, maybe we will use it. <laughs> and in the end, after 10 years, yes, when the East German colleagues consequently told us, why not use Bendermastin in that patient, then it happened that we used it occasionally. So it was my person when I started in the year 2000, the first study in a controlled way with a bendamustin. I right away combined it with rituximab and this was just another clinical trial in Germany to try to optimize the treatment option for patient. 
it was not a registration trial. It was done without pharmaceutical companies. It was just the motivation of doctors sitting together and say why we should not compare it to the existing chemo if maybe it is as good or better or maybe it is not as effective as the other treatments available. So we started that trial and at the same time in the States they heard about that trianda. I presented it first at the meetings. People came to the poster. You know we have that poster presentations in that large international meetings like ASH and ASCO and you can have an oral presentation like here or sometimes you give a poster presentation. And I was a young doctor, I mean 10 or 12 years younger than today and I was standing there first time in such an international meeting and I was very proud from Germany going here and so many people were standing around my poster. All asked the same question. How it comes that bendamustine is available in Germany and is not available in the States? That was clearly a very strange situation for all people. And I found that 50% of the people standing around my poster were doctors and the other were from pharmaceutical companies. So one of the pharmaceutical companies really made it on the basis of that discussion of that poster of a young German doctor to have the license for North America and that is how the American investigators like Red Carl and Jonathan Friedberg developed the bendamustine and they did a study in the rituximab refractory patients. So these are the people, very old photo, black and white, 1960. This is a group of the pharmacists and the doctors in Jena who developed bendamustine. Just one more introduction, that is the chemical structure of bendamustine. And if you are an expert or you will see it even if you are a lay, you see here that green group is present and that is the phosphomate partner uh, characteristics. So it's present here in the bendamustine. So they did another cyclophosphamide. However, they included another piece of the chemical structure of the clatribine or fluterabine, the so-called purine analogs. You see that red ring here, it's also here. So just from the chemical structure you have a feeling, oh, that is an interesting combination between two classes of products. So this was a trial. I um, uh, have um, the slides um, um, have from Jonathan Friedberg. He gave it to me to present it here. And this was a, one of the two slides which um, showed more or less the same results. So this was a study only with bendamustine without any rituximab in patients who relapsed indolent or transformed and are refractory to rituximab. So we would say as clinicians, oh, that is a patient group where it's a really more or less poorer prognosis when they are refractory to rituximab. What we should offer them? And this was a trial, it was bendamustine single agent and we all were interested in the results. What can a single agent chemotherapy achieve if patients do not respond to rituximab? So here are the results. All patients had prior rituximab and here you see they also had prior chemotherapy one prior chemotherapy in 41, two different and three different in 34 or in 13% of the patients. So heavily pretreated patient population. And the response rate was quite impressive. I was surprised from Germany when I read these results, 76% of the patients responded to just bendamustine without any rituximab when they are refractory to the last treatments. That is very challenged, very surprising and impressing. Also, they have done a sub-analysis and here it is. It is also to look for the patients who are not only refractory to rituximab, but also in addition refractory to rituximab plus chemotherapy. So that is the group chemo plus rituximab is not working together what is the best treatment and here bendamustine was sub-analyzed and this, you see the response rate in that patient group is 60 percent. So they concluded and I agree absolutely bendamustine as a single agent show a high response rate in this pretreated patient population who are rituximab refractory 
and also refractory to other alkylator chemotherapies, which is typically something like cyclophosphamide or the CHOP regimen. So that is why bendamustin is available and approved in the States. This is the official wording for bendamustin, and as mentioned before, the trade name for that is Trianda. So what you do when the patient is not rituximab refractory, but on the next side, as um, continuing the story from Brett Carl, if you are not treated at all, you are previously untreated and first diagnosed, and after a somewhat short or long duration of watch and wait, or sometimes immediately, the doctor decides together with you, we need chemotherapy plus rituximab. So I want to address that question now. What is the best treatment? Do we have any randomized trials who compare the one against the other treatment so that we can give a good recommendation to our patients? So I want to address that question. So this was investigated. What was at least the most often used treatment in the last decade in the States? And here you see the doctors in the United States, and this trial was published in the year 2009. The doctors asked retrospectively what was the most often used treatment in your institution. So 55% of American doctors administered CHOP plus rituximab, that is a poly chemotherapy consisting of four different medications. 23 used the less aggressive one, which is CVP, very comparable, but one compound is missing. And 15% were using something different, which is called flutarabine based plus rituximab. So that is the um, situation. There is um, no general consensus what is the best, and therefore the field is open for more randomized trials. I want to show you what was done in the last years. So one group from um, um, the States, and I'm very thankful to Oliver Press, who gave me that slide. He presented it. They done a randomized trial of the more or less most often used regimen, which is CHOP plus rituximab, and the other group of the patient got CHOP plus radioimmunotherapy, which is a radioactive immunoconjugated rituximab antibody. So very interesting trial. The whole community knows that trial was ongoing for the last 10 years. Everybody wanted to see the results. And these are the results. So it is like this. The progression free survival was presented at that meeting. And the curve with the CHOP plus radioimmunotherapy was here above the CHOP. And this was a little bit better than the CHOP plus rituximab. However, we say as uh, statisticians and as scientists, the difference maybe is there by chance because it was not statistically significant different. So that is progression-free survival. Everybody wants to see the overall survival probability. And again, the curves looks very comparable, but now it's the other way around. Also again, no statistically significant difference two curves looking very much, but now the radioimmunotherapy is a little bit inferior to CHOP plus rituximab. So in the end, as Brad Carl mentioned, you can look to these results a long time and you are discussing with your colleagues what is the best interpretation out of this. You can say both treatment strategies are quite good and comparable. And there is, of course, a difference if you give six times rituximab or one time radioimmunotherapy. So you cannot make a clear recommendation out of the trial. Another very interesting study was done. And again, I told you in the States it's given CVP or CHOP or flutarabine, both with rituximab. So this is a trial from Italy. And they compared it exactly what I said, all the three regimens together. What is the best when you do it randomly assigned to one third of the patients to the one, one third to the other, and one third to the third treatment? So that is what they found out. So the CVP is a little bit inferior, and CHOP plus rituximab is more or less the same in terms, again, of disease control. 
So the question is, what is the standard? Is rituximab chop the st uh, still the standard? Yes, at least it is in the best curve here. And the rituximab fluterabine is quite toxic. That was another conclusion. It was very effective, but quite toxic. So the Italian doctors still believe rituximab plus chop is the most often and best treatment. That is the moment why there is good reason to again challenge that so-called standard treatment CHOP. So in Germany, we investigated um, that um, treatment and we initiated that trial in the year 2003 in a large German cooperative study group. Bendamastin rituximab against CHOP plus rituximab. Just to say again, this is a disclosure very importantly. This drug combination is not approved from the FDA for the frontline setting. It is investigational and we have presented that trial and the results at many meetings. So uh, they are very open and, pub and public available. So this is what we've done again. I want to show you. We used just one single agent, bendamustin, in combination with rituximab against a polychemotherapy with these different chemotherapies. So when you have four, everybody can assume probably there is more side effects possible related to a four regimen uh, uh, compared to a single. On the other side, many colleagues when I was doing that study 10 years ago called me on the phone just imagine I was a young German doctor, not very well known, and suddenly my phone is ringing all the day, all from the very well-known professors, and they're telling me, what are you doing? You cannot compare one single agent to that very established standard. You're going to put your patient at risk. It's unethical. So I was discussing it with my colleagues, with my ethics committee. Yes, we should do this trial. Nobody knows if this is really inferior, but we expect that the toxicity is by far less. So the German authority, like the FDA, it's called BFARM, the German ethics committees all said, yes, do that trial. And in the end, I was feeling when so many people call me on the phone, probably, it is the right study to do. <laughs> yes, that is what I was feeling. And in the end, I show you the results now. It is good that we have done the study. As Brett Karl mentioned, indolent lymphomas not only include follicular, and we adopted that. We included that Waldenström's disease, that marginal zone, which was mentioned by Brett Karl, and the small lymphocytic. What is a special part of our study that we also included some elderly patients with mental cell lymphomas who are not eligible for a more aggressive treatment. So this uh, result, that is the official slide, was presented uh, to the world community of scientists just in May, also in Chicago. So this um, was a trial with all our patients as already showed you by Brad Carl with a GELF criteria. We used very similar, not exactly GELF, but very similar. All patients are in need of treatment uh, per these defined indications. Symptoms, hematopoietic failure, large tumor burden, rapid progression, or complications due to the disease. We included 514 patients, much more than expected, because the motivation in Germany to include patients in such a trial is very high. And of course, the German doctors, they are very convinced to investigate the so-called German compound. So they randomized their patients 514, and the vast majority of the patients had follicular lymphoma. This is a patient characteristics. Ed Brad Carl mentioned we need that information to compare it to other trials. So you see here the flippy factors which have been introduced to you. And of course, the most important thing is to see in both treatment arms, patient group is very similar. We're reflected by the age, 64 years here, 63 years here, some bone marrow infiltration in the same range, some elevated LDH. So it gives you a good feeling. The two groups of patients are very comparable. So first, we show the toxicity on all these meetings, showing that the side effects to the blood 
having some cytopenia after chemotherapy was seen less often after bendamustin rituximab. This is a cytopenia, a very severe one, we call it grade 3 and 4. This was by far less often seen in the bendamustin treated patient group. Only 12% of all treatment cycles had this cytopenia, compared to 38% of the CHOP treated group. On the other side of the coin, this growth factor, avoiding that side effect is GCSF or Nupagen. So that's a growth factor for the white blood cells, a very costive uh, product, high price for that. And you see in 20% of the treatment cycles after CHOP it was used and only in 4% after bendamustin. So from the non-hematological side effect, this is a difference. You have um, immediately, you can see alopecia hair loss is a big difference. No patient with bendamustin is going to have any hair loss, while every patient more or less has some degree of hair loss when you treat him with CHOP plus rituximab. That is of course, in my opinion, and my patients are going to tell me that every time a very important difference. Even if you know that your hair is coming back, patients coming to me two years in response, they tell me the worst thing about that six months of treatment two years ago was that I had hair loss. I believe it, yes, so that is a very important difference. Also, the patient with choprituximab had a little bit more neurotoxicity, more stomatitis, a little bit more infections, and we have seen more skin reactions as a side effect of the medications in the bendamustin treated group. So these are the response rates here, and this is a very good result for me as a young doctor in these days. I was very happy to see, no, patients were not at risk. At least the response rates are the same. 92% responded to that treatment compared to 91%. That is exactly the same. So we were very happy in the short term result of the treatment, it is the same. But this is not the most important in patients with that disease because achieving a response is more or less easy with a combination of rituximab plus chemotherapy. What is reflected here? 90% of patients respond it does not matter which treatment you are on. However, what is the long-term effect of that treatment? How long your disease is not coming back? How long you are chemotherapy-free for the next treatment? How long is the response lasting? And that was the primary goal of that treatment. And these are the results. And this was a surprise because it surprised nearly everybody that not CHOP plus rituximab is better, but bendamustine plus rituximab was superior to the CHOP plus rituximab curve. So that means in the end that the old developers in Jena 50 years ago, when they wanted to start their fight against the West German pharmaceutical companies to produce something which is more effective and less toxic, we see it here 50 years later that they probably had the right plan to develop bendamustin. So bendamustin had a median progression-free survival, and that is again a statistical calculation, as Brad Carl has explained it to you. 50% of patients still have no progression of disease after 70 months, compared to CHOP, in which 30, uh, after 31 months, patients had already a progression in the median. But this is for the total patient group, which is a little bit the weak part of that curve because it includes all different histologies. But also, I have shown here the results for the follicular lymphoma patients also. And here again you see that bendamustin rituximab was clearly superior to the CHOP rituximab curve. And now the median progression free is 41 months after CHOP R. And we have not achieved the median that is 50% with the bendamustin rituximab. So that is all the four entities. Just to show you, Stephanie has mentioned, we have also treated patients with some other lymphomas like Waldenströms 
and marginal zone was included. And this is the sub results. Always you see that the bendamustin rituximab, the yellow curve, appeared to be superior to the CHOP plus rituximab curve. So does it matter if you have a complete response? And that is, of course, a complicated issue because, as Brett Carl told us, that is not the same as to be cured. But when you have a complete response, that means that with no diagnostic procedure, you see something of your disease. The lymph node size is normal. Bone marrow infiltration is not present. You're feeling absolutely well. And so does that mean something for your outcome? Yes, it does. The patient who achieves a complete response in that trial did better in regard of progression-free survival. And also, interestingly, and maybe as expected, the so survival probability was better. The patient with complete responses had a longer survival probability than the patients who achieved only a partial response. That means that you could still see some lymphoma residual disease when you do your diagnostics after treatment. So this was adopted by the NCCN guidelines. This is a national cancer, a comprehensive cancer network. And I was um, very um, um, surprised that after my presentations in these countries here um, for the international scientific meetings, that the National Network for Comprehensive Cancer adapted um, that treatment recommendation in that slide. So it was a big moment in Germany that this was shown to the German doctors because not too many Germans look into that homepage a website of the NCCN guidelines. But then it was a rumor in Germany, look to the NCCN guidelines. The bendamustin rituximab is recommended there. How comes our trial made it to the world, interestingly? Yes, it made it to the world. So when you go to some other countries of the world, and I will show you soon, Benamastin is now available in most countries of the world. And you have seen that there are good reasons for that. So the NCCN guidelines recommend Benamastin rituximab as frontline treatment. And all German doctors made the following interpretation. Oh, look here. It's the very first recommendation. Again, <laughs> over our job. But this is not true. That is not meant by it. They say in that small letters here, this is in alphabetical order. <laughs> <laughs> to be very honest, when I saw that slide, only my eyes were focused here, and I have not read it. <laughs> and this happens to every doctor. I mean, if you are an expert looking to that NCCN guidelines, you know it, because they do it for all diseases. But when you're just looking occasionally, you are absolutely misled and you say, oh, I have to use this because this is the best. And that is not true. It is only some results I have showed you which is suggesting, yes, indeed, Bendamastin rituximab is a very effective treatment option. So this is how that old drug made it to the world. And I just want to show it because, from my view, that's a fascinating story. 1963, it was developed. 1992, a small company, which nobody knows, had it after the reunification. But I told you, nobody in Germany was using it, except the East German doctors. Then there was a small company in North America who had the license for developing 2002. And then it's available now in Japan countries from that company Symbio, in all European countries from that company. Then there is some availability in Russia, Middle East, North Africa, in Latin America, in all South Asian countries like Indonesia, Malaysia, in Australia, and of course in the States, in China, and just recently in Canada. A very interesting story. After 50 years, it is now available in the world, a very old German compound. And this is all the names available in the world. Interestingly, it's not so easy like just saying rituximab, because rituxin and rituximab is very similar. So the trade name is different. We have that Trianda in America, Livakt in Germany and Europe. Rebusmustin is a very old name. In Japan, it's called Treyakism. 
And in Singapore, it's called Simbenda, and probably there are some more names around the world. But more or less, all doctors know it only under the name Bendamustin. We know all that after the induction, like Bendamustin retook him up or Chop retook him up, probably you have to expect that the disease is coming back. And maybe and hopefully some of the patients are on a very long lasting response. But so we try to improve treatment in order to give something in addition after the chemotherapy plus rituximab, that is consolidation or maintenance treatment. So that was a one trial which was done by the French study group. And they, again, used that three different chemotherapies and then randomized rituximab maintenance or just observation. And that was uh, shown here and found by that study group. They showed that rituximab maintenance was superior to just watch and wait the patients after they have been successfully treated with a rituximab chemotherapy combination. And this is only in terms of progression-free survival. And the last speaker, Brett, already showed you that this is an ambivalent situation because just progression-free survival, as we show it in most studies, and as I have shown you with the bendamustine rituximab against chop rituximab, is the one side of the coin. But we do not know yet if this is really translating into a really improved overall survival. So. This is how we are doing it now in Germany. We adopted that two years maintenance, and therefore, we initiated that trial. And this is just to show you the perspective of the future. This is what the Germans have done. We have randomized bendamustine rituximab as a backbone for both treatment arms. And the one group is getting two years rituximab maintenance. The other arm is getting four years rituximab maintenance. Very interesting question. And I'm absolute open and eager to see the results, which we probably only can report in more than five years from now. And that is the other trial for the non-follicular, Waldenstrom marginal zone. We randomized bendamustine plus watch and wait against bendamustine rituximab in two years. So in the end, I say, as Brett Karl mentioned, I think there is still a role for watch and wait for certain patients. If it comes to treatment, combination of rituximab plus chemotherapy is standard. The bendamustine plus rituximab can be a preferred treatment option, at least according to my opinion. The rituximab maintenance as consolidation of achieved responses can be given. The high-dose treatment, which was not discussed, which is the autologous stem cell transplantation, only, in my opinion, is good for some patients with early relapses. But there are still more things ongoing in the future. We have many new compounds, bortezomib, ofatumumab, lenalidomide, GA101, ibrutinib, KA101, and I pointed them out in yellow because these are all under investigations, and the yellow one appears for me the very promising one. To show it in two slides, what is the future for the lymphoma treatment field? That is a one slide, very confusing. These are all the new agents on the horizon under investigations. Better you don't read it and you don't understand every word, but these are all new investigational agents. To summarize that slide in a more better and um, optical view, I created that slide. <laughs> what you would ask the machine for it, it's just the compounds under investigations for non-Hodgkin lymphoma. <laughs> yes, there are very many, and that is a good hope for all of us. Thank you for your attention. wonderful um, definition of low tumor burden, what we should do for that, higher tumor burden. We have a break coming up. Time for one question, and then we're going to have a panel discussion. All of our doctors and our colleagues from Rush will be up on the podium, and you can ask these questions for another half hour. One question. Okay. One question I have, though, is that you said that bendamustine rituximab is not approved as a first-line treatment, but it was offered to us as a first-line treatment not just by Dr. Gregory, but by another oncologist. So I was a little bit confused about that. 
So to be honest, I was told by some people in America to always say that, that it's not approved. Probably, as you can imagine, the people who tells, tells me that are lawyers. <laughs> so in Germany, I would not say it like this. Because we, as clinicians and as scientists, only believe in data. And we only treat our patients according to evidence and data. And in Germany, at least, it's not according to the label. Because a label sometimes is 10 years behind, and it's not moving so fast as we have seen new agents. So in Germany, when you do something which is effective, and in some cases you don't do it, you do something wrong. So in Germany, it does not protect you if it's in or off label. If a patient goes to you and you recommend only in label treatment, and on the other side, it is well known that another treatment is available, you have to give it. And the reimbursement issue is a little bit different in Germany than in America. So uh, that is the reason why I always present data and I cannot say how it is being dealt in all countries. So maybe I don't know, and of course you believe that I don't know. Ever maybe it's available for first line treatment in your country or not. The problem is that my trial definitely was never planned as a registration trial and therefore it is very logical that the American authorities will have a lot of problems just for formal reasons to accept such a trial study which we call in our terms IIT investigator initiated trials that usually is not accepted by the FDA for a later approval. Very clear. That's the rule. And so, I don't know. So in answer to your question, uh, if you have um, evidence that there is published data, or if you can go to the National Comprehensive Cancer Guidelines, the NCCN guidelines, and these combinations are listed as available for first line as a recommendation, or that you can show published articles, insurance companies will often pay for it when it's used front line. So that's how in the United States we are able to use some of these agents that by label are only indicated in the relapse refractory setting. Uh, and, and there is data um, that insurance companies will look at to pay for those drugs. One of the issues is if it's not approved, will insurance companies pay for it? Okay. 